Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight for this webinar and panelist discussion. My name is Josh Epstein, and I'm the marketing specialist for the TDA Perks Program, the for-profit subsidiary of the Texas Dental Association. TDA Perks offers members over 20 endorsed vendors, all of which are carefully reviewed and vetted by our board of directors, which consists of TDA members. You can find all of our trusted vendors by visiting tdaperks.com. Additionally, Perks offers a large volume of educational resources, such as articles and recorded webinars in our uh, website's resource section. Additionally, Perks has spearheaded the development of TDA Dental Concierge, a free CE tracking app designed by TDA members for TDA members. The app is just one of the several resources available to members of the association over the last two years. Close to 3,300 dentists and their staff have downloaded the app. We urge you to do the same. You can visit tdadentalconcierge.com uh, to register. And uh, there will be a question and answer uh, session at the end of our presentation. So please type your questions into the question box and we'll be sure to get them uh, answered. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have Dr. Libin. He is the CEO of Libin Group, a dental management consulting firm. Uh, he is internationally recognized as a prolific visionary. His revolutionary ideas meld modern management practices from the business world with real world experience in today's dental profession to create a discipline now supported by dental professional organizations worldwide. We also have Dr. Gerlach. He has practiced restorative dentistry for 36 years in Plano and Prosper, Texas. He is currently a co-owner of Prosper Dental Health. He is the co-founder of Phase 2 Dental, a transitions and consulting company. With his bride of 36 years, Dr. Lynn Gerlach, he was president of the Texas Dental Association in 2018 and 19 and currently serves as a president of our board of TDA Perks, our for-profit arm responsible for developing vendors to work with TDA members like Dental HQ. So he's received his certification in leadership coaching from two institutions, and Dr. Gerlach received his certificate from the ADA's Executive MBA program here at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Business Management. Uh, lastly, uh, we have Dr. Brett, Brett Wells. He's the founder and CEO of TDA Perks Vendor Dental HQ. He's a practicing dentist in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a frequent podcast guest star. He's a serial entrepreneur. He started Dental HQ to help fellow dentists increase patient care, case acceptance with in-house membership plans. Dr. Wells. Great. Thanks so much for that introdu introduction, Josh. And, you know, I'm thrilled to be on stage with such great, uh, wonderful presenters and Dr. Levin and Dr. Gerlach. Uh, we've really been working hard to put together a great, great presentation to talk about really important subjects tonight. Uh, I do just want to give a quick one minute shout out to Dental HQ. Uh, we founded um, and started building Dental HQ about five or six years ago to help dentists really um, quickly build and easily build their in-house membership plans. Back then, it was just kind of like this thing dentists were starting to do uh, that was really neat and, and great for uninsured patients. And it's really uh, snowballed into this great program that I would say uh, probably most dentists now offer. And Dental HQ is a great way to automate the, the uh, program, uh, create a simple uh, solution you can put into your website, automate the enrollment of your patients, the tracking of your patients, the reporting of your patients. We help you with marketing. We train your team, which is the key to having this uh, successful subscription program. So really, we we do everything you need to do from A to Z to have a really successful program uh, in 10 minutes or less. So uh, if you're interested, give us a call. We're not going to spend a lot of time today talking about membership plans. We're going to talk about really important stuff, and occasionally it might circle into membership plans. But I did just want to let all of your listeners know about um, uh, Dental HQ and how thrilled and flattered we are and how awesome the partnership's been with TDA Perks. It's really been phenomenal for us. We've we really enjoyed getting to know a lot of Texas dentists and, and are looking forward to that uh, relationship continuing to blossom. So uh, no more of that. Uh, let's talk about some really important stuff that I'm facing in my practices. I have five and I'll have six uh, uh, in six months. Uh, certainly facing all this stuff, been facing it since COVID. I've done some some podcasts and webinars with uh, Dr. Levin here working through all of the, the crazy COVID shutdown stuff and the aftermath. And so we're really starting to see some of that aftermath now not just locally with a, with a virus, but we're seeing some major things globally that are starting to really impact our practices. And, and Bill, first thing we're gonna talk about is kind of how some of those global um, uh, scenarios are kind of starting to affect us and, and what's happening in our practices or, and what's happening in America. So 
Um, you know, anything you'd like to share there about what you're seeing and how that's impacted you and your practices? Sure, sure, Brett. Thanks for, uh, uh, you know, I love the title of this webinar, you know, Inflation, Recession, and No-Shows, no Oh My, because here we, uh, um, and, you know, even before I go into that, Brett, I just want to say that as a user of your Dental HQ product, I really appreciate it. We had it. We we had a self-managed in-house uh, product in 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 our in our practice, but we moved to an automated standpoint and have really reaped the benefits of that. So so on a personal standpoint, love your stuff. Thanks, so, Bill. Yeah, he said you guys were crushing it. They told me to. Do it. Well, good, good, yeah. good. Yeah. So anyway, the um. Uh, you know, and being, thanks for inviting me to do this. I mean, to, to be included with you and Roger is just such a treat. So, um, but you know, getting back to your bigger question. So you're in a really global picture, right? You've got this global issue, this national issue of, uh, we certainly have non-transitory inflation, uh, but we have what, what economists are, are describing is we're going to have a, we're going to, while we have that underpinning of inflation, we are, they, they expect us to be sliding into a mild recession for next year. So what do you do with that? As a general dentist in Main Street, USA, what do you do with that big kind of picture? And so, you know, the old adage is that, that 90% of life happens to you. 10% is how you respond to it. And that's exactly what this is. You know, if you're in a little town, Ardmore, Oklahoma, I was reading an, art, an article the other day that Ardmore, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, their biggest employer is Michelin Tires for decades. Michelin Tires decided to pull out of Ardmore, and they're going to do so in, in a year or two. Well, that's going to really thump Ardmore. When you have a localized issue like that, you've got to have your ear to the ground. But when you have a broader, diverse economy, a Dallas, a San Antonio, a Houston, an Austin, these sorts of things. You, you know, you don't have that, that one company is going to, is going to sink my ship kind of thing. So when we're talking about big things that the talking heads talk on all the news apps, et cetera, what you really boil all that down to is fear. They're selling fear. And the question is if you are buying or not. When I talk about fear, I want to use the word fear and uncertainty almost interchangeably. And as a small business owner, um, the people on this call, I would assume that the, that the title of this call is probably going to attract more of a small business, a dentist owner, more than, more than any kind of other TDA member. But the, um, and there's going to be so much content. This is going to be a content rich hour, uh, with, uh, with Roger. And, uh, and that's gonna, it's, it's really where the rubber is going to meet the road, but getting back to the fears, how do you manage fear? And the management of fear, there's been a lot of work done on that over the last few decades. And one of the guys who was a thought leader in that is a guy named Bob Anderson. And Anderson developed a thing called the Leadership Circle Profile. And some of you may, have be, may be familiar with a 360 review. And that's where you get an, the opinion of many people that know you. You coalesce all that together, put it into an algorithm, and it, and it spits out who you are. Well, at the core of all of that, leadership lies at the core of of all of that. And it comes down to two things, safety or purpose, safety or purpose. And there's no right or wrong, good or bad on that. Some people are just generally more driven towards a, a safer environment, right? And don't get away from that. If that's, if that's who you are in your fiber, just go ahead, go with that. But there's going to be restrictions to that. There's a, there's a limitation if you're living more in a safety driven kind of an arena. Um, you tend to be an over performer. You tend to be an over controller. You tend to believe in the mindset that um, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. These sorts of things. While you may not have the big crash, you probably are going to have limited growth with that. Conversely, the purpose driven office or person is somebody who is, you know, regardless of what the news is telling you, they tend to gain energy. They tend to they tend to lead with vision. They tend to develop people around them who are motivated and high functioning. And so no right or wrong, it's kind of goes back to knowing who you are. And yes, you've got this underpinning of what's going on in the world around you. But I will tell you that, that if you focus too much on that, you can, you can become the deer in the headlights. Stay with your vision and breath. There's nobody that knows that better than you. I mean, you are a serial entrepreneur and you have a vision, you have a purpose and, and look at your results. You've knocked it out of the park with a great, a great product in Dental HQ. 
You're doing beautifully with your, your five soon to be six practices. And so you're a perfect example of a purpose driven leader. And so, so with that, Brett, let me, let me turn it back to you. Thanks, Bill. And, and some really great words to kind of get the juices flowing. I think it's important to look at purpose and leadership. So all through our careers, you know, 30 average, Roger could probably tell us what the average career is of a dentist, but all through our careers, we're going to deal with adversity. I mean, that's part of being a business center. It's, it's how you deal with that. Are you going to prepare yourself? Are you going to lead through that? Are you going to let it come and, and affect you and, and just kind of uh, respond as best as you can. Well, the point of tonight's webinar is to put you in a position where you can lead through it and be prepared for a lot of the stuff uh, that you're going to see and that you are seeing. And we're going to provide some solutions and some ideas. It's not the end of the road. You know, you're going to take these ideas and, and these uh, things we talk about and create plans for yourself uh, because nothing in your business and in your life is, happens on its own. You've got to proactively make this stuff happen. Uh, so, Roger, the next thing we're going to talk about here is kind of setting the table in terms of, you know, the, the government, uh, and we just talked about this, in a good way, pump money into the economy to help us get through COVID. You know, a lot of us were, were, were fearful that our, we were going to lose our businesses. I know I was when COVID happened and we lost all revenue. So the government starts pumping money into the economy. And they didn't really shut the spigot off in time. You know, they just kept pumping it in, which is nice. But then all of a sudden now we're, we're seeing the incredible inflation that that, that resulted from the, the incredibly low um, unemployment rates that resulted from that, the, the spending from consumers that seems to be starting to dry up. And I don't know, tell us what you're seeing over there at the, at the Levin Group and, and what we kind of need to be prepared for. Sure. Well, first of all, Brett, I'm thrilled to be with you and Bill. This is a great chance to educate. Um, you, you know, um, I love data. And that's one reason I like the Dental HQ product. It has the best data available for keeping, you know, for maintaining patient longevity. So let me give you some data points. Let me take what Bill did and now bring it down to the dental profession and give you some data points. So Levine Group does an annual survey with Dental Economics Magazine. We're about to do our 18th year in January. It's called the Dental Economics Levine Group Annual Survey. We don't get paid for it. It's our uh, uh, gift to the profession. But we also get a lot of good data to work with for our clients and consulting and the programs that we build. What happened was in 2021, I'm going to just glance over that in about two seconds. It was a record year for incredible numbers of practices because the pandemic was slowing down. People were coming back in. They had government money. But the main money they had was savings from not traveling, buying luxury, eating in restaurants, uh, et cetera. So there was a lot, and they were working from home. So there was a lot of time to go to the dentist. There was a lot of money to go to the dentist. Uh, we saw tons of practices have record years. And we reflected that in the survey of 2021. Unfortunately, and I, by the way, I'm a dentist also. Uh, as you know, I practice 10 years full time. Uh, we often think that whatever's happening today will just continue indefinitely. And then 2022 hit. And a lot of dentists thought, oh, I had a great 21. Look how well I've run my practice and the things I'm doing. And then in 2022, the economy changed. And what happened was staffing became the number one issue in all of dentistry. It was number one until 2022, where overhead suddenly became the number. We, we let them rank seven different issues. Overhead ranked as the number one issue. Why did overhead rise? Number one, we have a staffing crisis in dentistry. And I'm not being gloom and doom. Every, any practice can do extremely well. But this staffing issue will last about eight to 10 years. It's not going to be over in March for some reason. We lost 10 percent of our dental hygienists, which means we can't just hire a waitress. We meet in a restaurant that has a great personality to do hygiene. It's going to take time to build schools, graduates and licenses back. So staffing goes up about 10 percent and inflation, dental inflation, you know, it's great to look at the economy. I spend a lot of time doing that. But what's happening in the economy is not always what's happening in dentistry. In fact, we were recession proof until the 2008 and 9 recession. No recession ever affected our practices. Now it's different. And in 
And what ended up happening is inflation in dentistry, not including staffing, higher inflation, 10% rise in staff compensation led to about a 6.8% overall increase in overhead. Now, that's bad, but it wouldn't have mattered if practices were still growing in production. But instead, production remained relatively flat which meant that a lot of practices were now losing six to 7% of their profit. And just to put that in everyday terms, that's six to $7,000 of lost income on every $100,000 of production. So if there's a million dollar practice, that dentist is losing 60,000 to $70,000 of income, bottom line income per year. And in an era where the average retirement age of a dentist today is 72 years of age, this this becomes important. So real quickly, just to give everybody great hope for the future, the inflation in dental is not coming down. And the staffing, we're not going to see wages suddenly drop ever. No, Nobody likes having their wages cut. So what do we do? Any practice can drop overhead 3 to 4% or 4 or 5% by really tightening up. And you can do that one time. You know, let, let's say hypothetically you decided to work with one less team member. You can only do that once. You know, it's only one chance. But production is still the number one factor. Uh, my number one focus for practices is how do we increase production? Because production can go up theoretically infinitely. But if production goes up 10, 12, 14 percent, and your overhead went up 6%, you still got an 8% increase in profit margin. So you wanna focus on building production. My last comment is what came up this week, just to be as leading edge as we can. I track public dental companies because that's where the real data is. You, You can't get real data from private companies, but you can get it from public companies. Two of the largest dental companies are down in the last quarter. Now, when they drop, that would tell us that we're, see, we're going to see a drop in the number of patients no showing, our theme tonight, which we're going to address and give solutions. We're going to see a production drop unless practices take steps to really tighten up their systems and put that in place. So as a final comment, this is a great time to get your house in order, get your systems in place. As Bill said, get your leadership skills leading edge because that's what's going to keep practices very, very successful. And there are many successful practices that are growing every year today. Great and wonderful, wonderful insight, Dr. Levin. Um, You know, I'm going to move this conversation first through not necessarily growing production. That's going to be a big chunk of what I'm going to talk about after a couple points we make. But first, to kind of how to tighten up those P&Ls and your overhead uh, to get that to have the least impact from the inflation. You know, you mentioned it. I mean, it's staffing. Uh, Staffing is the biggest uh, spur of inflation in our in our dental practices in our individual offices. You know, when you've got, I know in, in our neck of the woods, hygiene pay was maybe 36 to $40 an hour. You're not getting a hygienist now for less than $50 an hour in the triangle. And that happened over the course of 18 months. You know, I mean, same with dental assistants through the roof. Same with, you know, we used to hire like entry level schedulers for like $14 an hour. Now nobody wants to walk into an office unless it's $20 an hour because they can get that at Chick-fil-A, right? So um What are some ideas or um, in terms of staffing, like you can't find a hygienist, right? So like, what can you do? What are some options? How do you retain the ones that you get uh, that you have and how do you attract the ones that you want to attract and how do you maximize the efficiency of of these much more expensive parts of your practice? Who do you want to go first? I mean, I've got ideas too, but but I I want to hear from you, the man of the hour. Well, just as a quick list, um, there are a lot of things you can do. Number one, dentists need to get very, number one, get familiar with compensation in your area. The easiest way to do that, go online, look at the recruiting sites. It's all public information now. You'll see what's being offered. Number two, 
uh, for signing bonuses. It all depends. And again, each of these recommendations, it depends on how desperate you are and how much of a shortage or low supply of staff are in your area. So California, for example, very, very difficult. Virginia, not as difficult. So number two would be signing bonuses. Now, when you pay a signing bonus, you don't do what one dentist did right before he called us for help. Uh, he gave a $5,000 signing bonus. He gave her the, all the money the day she started. She didn't come back after the third day. Uh, good, good luck getting that money back. So you, you roll that out over six months. Number three, you write ads that are not your standard ad. We're not just seeking a dental hygienist or seeking a dental assistant. Write ads about your culture, about cooperative effort, about positive environment. People care about money, but they also want to be part of something where they can be happy. Number four, offer your staff a bonus, and it's got to be significant, $1,500 or $2,000. You've got to get their attention if they refer someone they know that you hire who stays for 90 days. Number five is not recruiting, but I'm big now on longevity bonuses. At year one, three, five, 10, 15, and 20, the bonuses scale up. It starts to sound like a lot of money. It is a lot of money but it's pennies compared to the cost of turnover. Our data shows that the cost of turnover of, an, of a well-trained team member is the loss of 50 to $100,000 in lost production. Now, you don't notice that because you didn't get it. It's not that you're writing a check, but that, that's what you lose in lost production. You also need, and Bill can talk about this because he's you know quite, very well-versed in leadership, but you need a leader who creates a culture. I gave a webinar very recently, and their their leadership, there are a million ways to be a leader, and it's very situational. But the one thing I said that I believe is if you want to become a great leader by tomorrow, because Bill and I know that leadership's really hard, be the example of what you want your team to be. Just write down the characteristics, five or six of them, no more than six, that you want to see in your team and start living them every single day. Be the person your dog wants you to be. I love that expression. Be the leader that your team will rally around and want to stay with. Quick anecdote, we have a client and an assistant had to move an hour and a half away because her husband was transferred. She kept her job. She never thought about quitting. She drives an hour and a half each way. And she said to me, I love my doctor and he trusts me. And by the way, we recommended, and I think it's great, give her a gas allowance that she didn't ask for it, but you don't want her to wake up one day and say, okay, this is getting too hard. So those are some recommendations. Well, I, you know, a couple of things I want to just comment on that. One is if you go on to Indeed or whatever platform you're looking at to, to post an ad and just type dental assistant or hygienist, I mean, if you're in a major metro area, you're going to see five pages, hundreds of ads. And look at them, most of them are just boring. Hygienists needed, like, here's our hours. Like, you got to be creative. You, it, The color of your practice and your culture and your people have to come through on those, uh, on those ads. You know, what are your values of your company? What do you support? The technology, you like to have fun. We do Taco Tuesdays in my practices. Like, you get free tacos if you work for us. Your ad has to stand out from the competition are just going to get lost in the avalanche of, of ads out there. And then, you know, having values and hired to those values. It's harder now because we don't have a lot of options. But, you know, if you don't have values and, and you're just hiring anybody and uh, you're, you're willing to deal with whatever comes in, well, the people that you do want and, and that uh, are there are going to leave. So, so you want to build a culture in your business that people want to join and they want to stay with. And then I'll tell you this, even though it's hard to do, you're going to start getting employees referred to your practice who just hear how great it is to work for you. And you don't even have to do as much with ads. And, and, but you've got to be um, proactive about this. It isn't just going to happen. So, um, Brett, could I jump on that for just a second? I was, I was just going to hand it over to you, Bill, because I know you've had some great insight on this building your practices. I want to tell you that the difference between a good dental practice and a great dental practice is leadership. So many of our colleagues think that they're going to become a great dental practice if they learn to do a new procedure, if they take another CE course, if they do a little bit better marketing. All of those things are really good. 
But the one thing that's going to separate you, that's going to be your differentiator, is leadership. So what is that? I will tell you that my partner and I at our little practice up in Prosper, Texas, if somebody asked me, what do you do for a living? I said, I try, by, I try my very best to grow people. I'm a person grower. Nothing makes me happier than to grow somebody, coach somebody, and they elevate. They actually launch. And in the, and in the process of doing so, they're bringing so much more value to, to, your, to that practice. And then who knows? Maybe they get to the point where, where th- instead of being an assistant, they now want a, a, a school approach them to be the, 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 the trainer of assistants. That's growing people. And, and that is, an, that is the, the abundance mindset that if we have that and if you grow people, they will grow you. That is a great synergistic circle. And the second point that I want to that I want to tap onto is is what you just said about you were talking about core values. To me, developing a culture is a simple mathematic equation. Culture equals core values plus tolerated norms. It's as simple as that. Yeah. What are your co- core values? You can name three of them, five of them, whatever. They can be a word. They can be a short phrase. But develop those with your team. What do I mean by a tolerated norm? A tolerated norm is something that your, your team develops. For example, we will all be on, on site by 740 to have our morning huddle at 745. No question about it. Well, if the same person keeps, keeps coming in at 750, telling you that they got, they got stuck behind the same train, well, take a different route. But I want you to be here at 740. Right. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I read a book once. It was by a Navy SEAL. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink is, is what it was. Yeah. A, a phrase jumped out of that book that just, it smacked me right in the face. It was leadership is not what you preach. It's what you tolerate. Yeah. That's powerful. I thought it was too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for letting me no, jump yeah. in. No, great, Bill. Great insight. Um, I'm, you know, we could talk about staffing for this entire uh, webinar, but we're going to move on to one other category. So for me, I know in my practice, uh, you know, labor costs started to start to inch up. We knew we couldn't go with the norm, which was traditionally I'd always been told 25, 26 percent if you include all benefits and everything. Is that right? Still, Roger, what, that was the norm. About 25 percent to 26 percent all in. Yeah. And so I knew with with uh, salaries going up and up and up that wasn't going to work for our practice, you know, unless you could just incredibly grow revenue. And so I said, well, where are we going to make up this percent or two? Because it's now looking closer to 28%. And so the first thing I looked at is supply and lab costs. Like we didn't have super tight systems around that. And so I started investigating, speaking with friends, uh, dental practice owners, group practice owners. uh, What are their best practices for getting their supply costs in line? Because I'm talking to some of them, they're at like four five uh, percent or less and I'm and I know that's where I want to be but I'm looking at mine I'm like six seven percent some months it's even more than that and I'm knowing that I have a systems problem uh, so we started investigating and some of the things that we find out and started implementing one was uh, to find an automated uh, platform to help us track what we're ordering so our team can see what they're ordering and how much they're spending as a percent of revenue instead of just this um, you know, imaginary, I need this, I need that, but having no idea where they stand in the frame of, of revenue and what it's costing the practice. So, so we got an automated solution where we tried five or six of them and finally found one that we really liked. Um, we, uh, we reduced our, our ordering frequency down to once a month instead of every twice a week or whatever they were doing. So the fewer you order, fewer times per month that you order, you can do bulk ordering and you're not going to over order uh, because you're not doing it so regularly. This is proven. The fewer times you order, the less money you spend on ordering. And then we give our team targets of how, here's how much we want to spend per month. It's 5%. Um, this is how much revenue we we in, uh, we predict we're going to make. So you have, let's say, $10,000 to spend this month on supplies. Well, if you only spend 8000 this month on supplies, and this is something you know we could argue about whether or not, because there is a this can be a double-edged sword, but we'll give 25% of the savings under that $10,000 back to our team to, to split. You know, So we incentivize them to help us meet those supply ordering. And then all of a sudden, what do we see? Our supply costs got down to 4.5%. You know? So we went from 7 plus percent 
down to under 5%, and that made up that 2% increase we saw on labor. Uh, so that helped us with overhead. Um, uh, anything else? Uh, no, nah, yeah, that's that's pretty much everything we did to, to get it under control. So I would encourage you, if you don't have really tight inventory and supply ordering systems, to start looking at that. Because you can't help that the labor costs have gone through the roof. You just got to pay it uh, a lot of times if you want to hire these people uh, because they're so valuable to your business. Um, so you've got to look for other areas of your business where you can improve operations and systems. Same with labs. I mean, you could research your labs and make sure you're getting the best pricing and using the best products. Uh, but Roger, Bill, anything else you wanted to add on supplies? Yeah, I, I would. Um, you know, our supply representatives are smart people that want to keep our business. And there's, if you do, if you work with one company mainly or two, and you're a big enough customer, calling your sales, you know, sales reps come in, Brett, we're, we're all three dentists here. And we know that we kind of take them for granted. We don't pay a lot of attention. Some of them have the run of the house. They can come in and order anything they want. And I suggest dentists sit down with their supply rep and say, listen, love working with you. We've been friends for 20 years now because that's what salespeople are good at being your friend. They should be. And we appreciate it. But we and here's an example. We've made a decision to lower our costs in this area by 10 percent. Can you help me do that? Rarely, unless you're a small practice or a small player for that company, rarely have I not seen that work because they have other options. But they don't get up in the morning and say, well, how do I lower Brett Wells' costs? It's just not the way they think. It's not that they're taking advantage of you. But if you call the rep in and say, listen, want to lower my costs, they've got, you mentioned bulk purchasing, they've got all kinds of options and creative solutions to keep your business. So this is a great way to reduce costs and you don't have to leave your vendor. Number two, big companies have require their departments to get three bids on all major expenses. So take your non bid take your biddable expenses. Your lease is not biddable, but you can bid out your top 10 biddable expenses get three different bids. You don't have to leave your vendor, but that gives you information on where does the market stand? Like, like you found out you were, your supply cost was a higher percentage than you wanted. Well, you bring that down by knowing the company A will charge you this much, B will charge you this much. Well, I really like company C. And then you can say to company C, listen, love working with you, but I need you to be at A or B. So those are two suggestions that work very well. Yeah. Exactly. Creating a formulary. We created a formulary to have all of our uh, supplies on a list and you had to kind of stay within these. Uh, you know, we have a lot of docs who work for us. So that was important. That's not as important. I think if you if you've got a single practice, single doc, but for us, it, it was important. So I'm going to move through a few more to, so we can make sure we have a full amount of time on no shows. But, you know, now that we've talked about kind of like ways to kind of trim overhead, let's talk about ways to drive revenue. And, and, you know, the easiest way that we all wish we could just snap our fingers and do uh, is just raising fees, right? So now I was always taught, and I don't know where I heard this, but every year you should raise your fees 3%. Your standard fees, is that still the case, Roger? Is that what you recommend to your to your offices? No, we. I mean, it's fine, but we recommend 5%. Now, for the last 10 years prior to 2022, 3% was fine because inflation was close to zero. Yeah. Today you need to be raising fees five percent. Okay, and I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you discuss the challenge. Otherwise, I'll bring it up now. So I'll, I'll give it back yeah. to you. So the challenge is obvious, right? Um, you're a network. You've got you're in network fee schedules. I assume that's what you're alluding to. And so you can't do anything about that. Uh, what I recommend, and I negotiate all my. Uh, we're a network with several insurances. Uh, we have a membership plan, which obviously is very important to us. But we do take insurance in my practice. Uh, I negotiate insurances myself. Now, there are some great companies who do that. I tried one or two and didn't have great results, but I know there's other ones out there that do a phenomenal job with it. But I found to get the best results was when I call those insurance reps myself. And, and I have a nice spreadsheet where I track the top 10 to 15 codes that I've received the most revenue off of. And that's all I look at when I'm negotiating insurance. They like to throw a giant, like maybe implant fee and get you excited about this really good implant fee. Meanwhile, you're getting just murdered and clobbered on a profi fee, which is what 
you're getting the most revenue out of, right? That D1110. So you want to know what those most revenue generating codes are when you're negotiating insurance. You do it every two years. Okay. So like, like uh, clockwork, you set your calendar and every two years you reach out to those insurance companies. I know Aetna for me, every time I reach out to them, I'm getting a 2% increase, right? I'm going to push back this year because inflation has been so much and try to push for more than 2%. But I know all I have to do is send an email every two years and I'm getting 2%. If you're not doing that and you're just reaching out every five or six years, you're still going to get that 2%, but you could have gotten three 2% in that six years instead of just your one 2%. So do it regularly every two years and hold firm with them. Um, the other thing I like to do is I run a list of all the top employers in my area, maybe the 20 top employers, and we go into our, our open dental database and we see what insurance networks that they're in. And so I know kind of the insurance networks I need to be uh, really targeting and going after. So those are just a few little tricks uh, that we do. You can also, um, you can drop insurances and we've done some great information and, and even have a calculator at Dental HQ about how many patients you need to retain to maintain profitability if you do drop insurances. But, you know, I'd be careful right now about uh, dropping insurances just with everything going on with the economy um, and have a good plan. We have a great strategy guide at Dental HQ if you're going to do that. But so raising fees, uh, negotiating your insurance rates, your membership plans. Don't forget Dental HQ membership plans. You can go in easily with Dental HQ and we, we've got a way to notify all of your patients and raise those membership fees. I think we raised them $2 last year per month and I think $25 annually. So you want to be raising those membership fees, which you do have complete control over, unlike the insurance uh, networks that you do not. So don't forget about those. Uh, you want to add uh, more elective services. And Roger, you might be able to, and Bill, you might be able to uh, speak on this, but Invisalign, we're doing a lot more Invisalign now with our iTeras that we got. We're doing sleep now in our in our practice. This is a new revenue, new revenue source that we never had before. Uh, we're recommending fluoride on a lot more patients because quite honestly, nearly every patient can benefit from fluoride. And we just weren't talking uh, with our adult patients about it as much as we are now and, and implants, we're doing a lot of stuff with implants and we, we sell them packages and, and make them really affordable for patients. So, you know, adding technology, adding elective services, these are all things that are going to drive revenue. Um, and before I move on to uh, no shows, Roger, Bill, anything you want to add to that? Bill, you go first. Sure. The only thing that I would add to that is, is I want to piggyback back to Dental HQ on this, Brett. As I'm coaching, as I'm coaching my clients, our my practice in, in Prosper, we're a fee for service practice. It's a pros practice. So I'm not talking about my office. I want to talk about some of my clients' offices. Um, uh, some of them are very heavily dependent on PPOs. If you have a, if you and and perhaps your guy with Dental HQ can help with this, Brett, but. But we have a software that there's a, uh, we do a sensitivity testing. We look at the number of patients that, that a PPO has in your practice, the amount of gross revenue that that has uh, produced, the amount that you have written off and, uh, you know, production and then write offs down to revenue. And, uh, and we come up with a number saying, gosh, if you were to drop that PPO, if you kept 20% of those patients, you'd actually still make more money. Yeah, we have we, I've got a couple clients where they are. Um, one was so bad, I encouraged them. I said, just tell you what, next time anybody calls from that particular PPO and it's a thousand dollar procedure, just write them a check for a hundred bucks because you're losing hundred dollars each time that person comes in. So if you give them the hundred dollars, you'll at least have that hour to maybe do something profitable. It's yeah. it's 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 really bad. And Dennis, don't you know, we're just we, we tend to be a pretty intuitive group. And and this is an area that absolutely requires analytics to where you, you've got to get really tight on let's keep this one. Let's drop this one. I've had clients tell me I'm pretty sure that it's insurance company A that I need to drop. And it, and it comes back and it was insurance company B. So yeah. don't let your don't let your heart drive this. Let 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 a spreadsheet drive this for you. And again, we have a calculator at Dental HQ where you put in your fees, you put in the write-offs of, of some of the top codes for your uh, uh, protein preventative codes uh, of the insurance companies. And it will literally say, if you drop this insurance, you need to keep 40% of, of the patients to maintain the same profitability from that insurance plan. Because now all of a sudden those patients are paying you your full fees, so you don't need to keep them all. Um, and so it's a pretty cool little, little um, calculator. An, MB, an MBA guy would call that a sensitivity test. But Brett, I'll tell you, yeah. Uh, yeah, but Brett, I'll tell you, when I get down to the 
hey, you know what? Let's pull the trigger on this one. This is really the pits. This is a really bad yeah. plan that you signed up for. This dental HQ thing can replace that. 100%. And, 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 and it's like, oh, wow. And, and so it's really kind of triggering some, uh, some really great epiphanies. So that's, that's my part. Roger, you have, you have probably a whole lot better stuff than that. Well, not, not uh, Bill. I, I love what you said. I, I think it's fantastic. I'll just add to it. I'm, I'm glad we have five hours tonight for the webinar um, because, Bill, what you're saying is absolutely right. Number, let, let me just go quickly. You have to do analysis. Insurance is not an enemy. It's not a friend. It's a business decision. Uh, sitting around complaining about it, hating them, whatever, doesn't work. You've got to take action. Number one, you got to raise your fees every year. And Brett said, you, call, you negotiate every two years, but you send your increased fees in every single year because that does affect your profile. Number two, uh, you want to be careful. Dentists make as bad emotional decisions of getting out of insurance as getting in. And we meet a lot of practices after they've really hurt themselves because they got out without a plan. They just had an emotional anger. There's a seven step analysis that we use. It feeds into the process. But 89% of dental practices participate in one or more plans. And Dental HQ ought to be not only a replacement for plans, it's an adjunct to the entire practice. So if, just because you're not planning to drop a plan, Dental HQ is another way to increase production. But I just finished a three-year research study because I'm fascinated by production, and I've come up with 244 ways to increase practice production, and I was trying to rank them in priority order. The problem is the priorities keep changing. But for example, if you participate with insurance, you've got to maximize your efficiency. Nobody wants to hear this, but if you're going to get paid less, the only way to maintain revenue and profit is to do more. Now, doing more doesn't mean rushing. I'm a dentist. We all hate that. But you've got to have more efficient systems. You've got to do more per patient. 81% of dental general dental procedures are single tooth treatment. I'm giving a webinar tomorrow talking about comprehensive diagnosis, comprehensive treatment plan presentation, comprehensive presentation of ideal treatment and comprehensive fees. So get efficient. Number three, reactivate your overdue patients. That one step can skyrocket your production. And overdue means overdue. If they're overdue by one day, they are overdue. You need a discipline where you've got somebody calling overdue patients every single day. There's a nine-step process of text, email, call. That works. Hygiene, Brett, you mentioned it. You want to raise hygiene revenue by 20%. Every practice is behind on x-rays and fluoride. And they all tell us, every new client tells us they're not. And then we find $40,000, $50,000 where they're behind. Sealants. I don't tell dentists how to practice, but I am a dentist. I get it to some degree. Brett, you're a practicing dentist, so you've got a lot of knowledge and credibility. Sealants, fluoride. And the biggest thing is the hygienist identifying services for the dentist. The fantasy of every dentist is to walk into the hygiene room and the patient looks at you and says, I need an implant. I need ortho. I need veneers. Great hygienists can do that. And by the way, you're now going to pay them a lot more money. So you may as well, without, without rushing them, ask them and train them to identify huge potential treatment. You should be measuring how much dentistry is referred back to the dentist from the hygiene rooms. That's a critical element to look at as well. I could go on and on, but there are some things. Oh, by the way, where we're going, no-shows are one of the most serious production losses in a 36-year career. And I'll let you take that one from there, Brett. Yeah, uh, interesting side note. We uh, we in, uh, we recently purchased uh, Iteros at all of our practices because uh, we really wanted to make a bigger um, splash or uh, focus on Invisalign, and we incentivized our hygienists that hey, if if you can get a, a a patient to either start or pay for an Invisalign, we'll give you one hundred fifty dollars. So now we have you know some of, some of our hygienists are really great at this. I mean, we have the doctor walks into the room. And the hygienist has already scanned them. And it's just like, give me the measurements that are ready to go with the Invisalign. You know, if you align the, the kind of interest financially and from a patient health standpoint um, with your team, you can really start to get some momentum with some of these different uh, procedures that you're looking to bring on board. But real you know, fast, Brett, by the way, with war, I'm, I'm doing big research right now on 
workflow technology and efficiency. Mm. You can a dentist can pick up 12 to 13 percent more time with workflow technology if you understand how to delegate, how to let your team do things. They can they can correct when things aren't right. It I mean. We have we have a one process I'm looking at that used to take the dentist 12 steps. Now the dentist only does four of the steps. So there's huge opportunity with technology as well. In fact, if it wasn't for technology, Dental HQ wouldn't be here. Right. Right. Technology is really making dentistry a lot better and more efficient yeah. and profitable. So uh, let's hit the, the last topic we're going to talk about today and, and be sure to, to uh, throw some questions in that chat box. If you have any, we'll save five minutes at the end to talk about them. Uh, but no shows, you know, pre COVID and I spoke and I actually just uh, had an article published on this in dental economics and inside dentistry in October about uh, no shows and a 10 step process to reduce them. So we're going to go through some of those steps today. Um, but pre COVID, I spoke with dental Intel about this. The, the, the target rate for an office for no shows was under 10%. 8% was an average. Uh, anything under 10% was pretty good, but 8% was doing really good. Um, and, uh, we started having a big no-show issue. Like our, our no-show rates were going up and up and up and up. And so we made a really uh, intentional approach of, of different ways we could kind of strike this down. And it's not, there's not one, one solution that fixes it all, but there's a lot of different things we did and changed and tweaked to, to get our, our rates post COVID down to where they are now, which is 8%. But Dental Intel tells me that now post COVID, a good office is at 12 to 15 percent, which is just nuts to me. I mean, you know, that's a growing office. I would imagine a more mature office that isn't seeing as many new patients is probably going to have an easier time getting under 10 percent. But the fact that Dental Intel is telling me the average they're seeing now in the United States is 12 to 15 percent is nuts. In our practice, an appointment averages at three hundred ten dollars. So every so, so that's saying that, you know, eight percent of our uh, appointments are uh our no-showing cost is $310. We did some analytics around this, and we found that we have an average of 27,000 appointments a year across our platform. 8% of that at a $310 average is $800,000 a year just being ripped out of our uh, bottom line uh, because patients aren't showing up. We've got our, la our, 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 our team we're paying to be there. Um, we've got the rent we're paying, and we've got an empty chair. And so no-shows are incredibly important and Roger, you know, what are you seeing uh, in terms of some of the analytics and the data around this uh, that maybe I haven't alluded to here? Sure. And I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but I just want to mention, Bill, I'm sure you'll talk about the importance of building value. Uh, I think one of the main reasons for no-shows is patients don't value their appointments, and we need to build that value, but I'll let Bill do that part. So here's what I'm seeing with no-shows. First of all, no-shows are really bad. When dentists are now working on average to 72 years of age, and if we have DSO dentists attending this tonight, you're now employees, so you will have to save based on your income only. You're not going to have an asset later. So I'm concerned about that because I really do care very much about our colleagues. And the earlier people understand this, the better they can course correct in their savings. So no-shows are a huge opportunity. Uh, our data shows that over a 36-year career, a practice will lose between four and six million dollars of revenue. And I've got real data on this. This isn't an opinion. Four to six million dollars of revenue in 36 years. Now, when you're talking about working to 72, 10 years later than it was 30 years ago, because I want people targeting age, you don't have to retire at 62, but I'd like you to be, the real words I use are financial independent. No-shows can probably get 60 to 70% of that taken care of for you. But in economics, a no-show causes what's called a non-recoverable resource. You can never get back the chair time you lose to a no-show. So if you have a product and you don't sell it today, you can sell it tomorrow. But if you've got chair time that isn't sold today, you can't sell it tomorrow. Also, as you and Bill know, every no-show, unless it's a massive case, which is unusual, every no-show ends up losing money on that case. When they come back the second time, you're, in, you're, you're not breaking even. You're not getting zero. You're in negative profit territory. So we've got to work very hard to get no-shows in the door. Our target, Brett, is 2% or below. 
but Ooh. you have to take, yep. It's, but it's, it's doable. Now I'll tell you right now why it doesn't seem doable. Whenever the economy slows down, no shows go up that this is not new. And if you look, I look at a lot of data points economically to bring back to dentistry. Credit card debt is at an all time high. That tells you that all that money we saved during COVID, we're not saving anymore. And we're now using our credit cards and that's about to run out. And care credit's great, but after that, we, we really aren't gonna have anywhere for patients to go. So when patients have an appointment and they're tight on their bills of any kind, that's when they say to themselves, you know, I think I'll skip that hygiene appointment today, or maybe I won't do that restoration today. And that's where we have to build incredible value. But I'll let Bill talk about that. To me, value is simple. People pay for that which they value. And, and you've, got to become, you've got to become exceptional. All right. And it doesn't matter if you're a fee for service practice or a PPO practice. Work on becoming exceptional because that comes through. It's easier for your team to, to sell you if, you, if, if, if you will, because you know what? This doctor, this practice is exceptional, meaning you are getting a value for what you do. And the other part of that is people value friendships, they value their relationships. And when you put with that, you know, Mrs. Jones, if you don't come in, then your hygienist, Susan, who's your buddy, is going to be sitting here without anything to do for the hour. That's your hour that we gave to you. We don't double book. That's your hour. And and uh, I don't know. Maybe that's a little squeezing of the heart. I don't know. Whatever. But it is it is a value. And and we and it's important that you make it so. You have to be it in order yeah. to make it so. Yeah, uh, so important is building value, building the, that personal relationship. I mean, that is one thing we have in dentistry. It's, it's a very personal business. You're inches from somebody's face getting to know them. And so we do have that over, um, you know, going to buy a suit at, at Saks. Um, so you can leverage that. And that's one of the points that I'm going to speak about. And if I go through this kind of quickly, we are going to be sending out a takeaway to all the uh, everyone who signed up for this about a nice uh 10 step uh, process for reducing no shows and cancellations. Um, but one of the steps is kind of changing the verbiage of these appointments to not just, hey, calling to confirm your appointment in two days, uh, let us know if you can't make it. It's, hey, we're calling to remind you of your, reserva your reservation with Betty. She's looking forward to see, seeing you for your cleaning in two days, right? So you're, connect you're creating that personal connection so they understand it's, it's with somebody who's not going to see them and be disappointed if they don't show up. So exactly what Bill was just alluding to. Uh, and, and really, and I hope mo most, if not all of you have this, but you got to have a policy in place. I mean, we have patients sign it and initial it, our cancellation no-show policy. So have a policy in place. It needs to be intentional. It needs to be thought through. And have your patients sign it as part of their intake forms. If they're already patients and you update it, then have them sign the updated one. Uh, you should, and, and this is up for debate. A lot of people, especially pre-COVID, were like, oh, don't do this. But I've always done it, and I've always erred on the side. Roger Bill might have different opinions, but you got to have a cancellation fee. People are just used to it now. But, um, you know, we give everybody a pass as long as they call and try to try to give us a warning they're not going to show up once. After that, it's 75 bucks, and they're signing off, off on this, and we're warning them about it. We're not just letting them out of the appointment. We're reminding them of that $75 uh, no-show fee if they cancel in under 24 hours. Uh, we also have done this since the beginning, charge a deposit fee. We've now increased it to $75, but that incredibly cuts down on your bigger appointments. So we charge it for like crowns, uh, Invisalign, root canals, like anything bigger that's going to take up more time in the chair. We charge this deposit and that forces the patient when they're going to make that appointment to really think through, do I have anything else going on? Am I sure I can make this thing because I don't want to put this money down and lose it. So we have very, very few no shows. I would definitely say less than 2%, probably like 0.1% of our actual like larger procedures. It's made me wonder if we shouldn't just do deposits for everything, but we're not going to. Um, but taking deposits for your bigger appointments are, are really good. Uh, and that kind of leads into having uh, your patients double check their calendar when making an appointment. It can be as simple as that. You know, you might go, hey, February 21st at two o'clock at Thursday, are you good? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. 
you want to double check your calendar and then they look at their calendar. Oh, no, 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 I got swim lessons for the boys that day, you know? So have them double check their calendar to put some effort into making that appointment, but make sure and have that appointment scheduled before they leave in terms of uh, reducing um, uh, attrition in your practice. So in terms of a confirmation protocol, you got to have a good, strong confirmation protocol. Um, in our practice, and we built this uh, with the advice of Modento and Dental Intel, we do a two-week reminder. There's no confirmation that happens. We send that by text and email. We do a one-week confirmation where, uh, by text and email where we ask them, you know, either respond with a yes or respond to email with a click on the yes button that they're going to be there. If they don't respond to that, then at three day, they get another text email. And if they don't respond to that at two days, we're on the phone. We're calling. Are you guys? Are you going to be here or not? Because in my practice, we we did some uh, uh, analytics on this as well, and we looked at I think ten thousand appointments, and we found that of the unconfirmed appointments, they had a thirty three percent no show rate. So your unconfirmed appointments are going to be your highest risk of no showing, just like your your new patients. Um, but we want to get those patients confirmed, and honestly, unconfirmed no show rates are so high, we really even sometimes will double book those appointments because we know there's a one in three chance they're not going to show up. Um, so two-day confirmation. And then we do just a quick three-hour reminder, text and email, just remind them, hey, you've already confirmed, you got an appointment in three hours, just want to remind you. Uh, so that's our protocols. Uh, again, that's in that white paper. You can tweak those to what works best for you. We've tweaked that a million times over the past probably eight years, and that seems to be the protocol that we get the least pushback from patients and have the best results from. Um, again, I mentioned on here double booking for those high-risk appointments, high-risk patients. Uh, what we do is we have a patient, we give them one warning, all right, we're not going to charge you the fee. We charge them the fee the next time. They do it again. They go on our uh, same-day call list, so uh, they can't make appointments. They have to, we'll call them if we have an availability. They know show that appointment, they're out, all right? And, and kind of alluding to that, Roger, I want to talk a little bit about at what point this this is so many offices are so scared to fire patients. At what point do we fire patients? Because it, it's you got to do it. Like you can't just be scared to have that call or write that letter. Like there's a point where it's just hurting the uh, revenue and and the ability for other patients to get in by these people who don't show up. So what's your do you have a rule on that? Well, we do, we do. Um, and and first of all, you can't operate a business in fear. You've got to create your customer service program. I've written extensively on customer service, done endless research of the Ritz-Carlton, Disney, and Nordstrom, three of the best. I've read every book. I've been to their institutes. Uh, Two of them have institutes. And here's reality. you, You remove the customer when you're losing money. Now, we're not talking about a behavioral problem. We're not talking about treating the staff poorly. Those are other reasons to consider. But when you're losing money, so the Living Group has a nine-step process for no-shows. And after they miss two appointments in a year, they are no longer getting appointments. So you call it a same-day list. We call it a short list. But we don't necessarily call them. Now, the good news there is they'll be back for emergencies, and that is production, but make sure you do everything the day they come in, because if you give them two appointments, so we call them habitual no-shows, Brett. It's a small percentage. They cannot help it, no matter how much you try to uh, modify their behavior. So at the point where you're going to lose money, that's the time to say, you know, sorry, we're not going to be able to help you. There is a danger, though. They're often attached to a family, and it might just be the father or the mother who miss appointments. So that's why we we put them on this phantom short list, and then we typically just don't call them. Yeah, and then the other worry I think we face as dentists, um, especially when our names on the roof, is the reviews. They, you know, it always gets twisted, right? So you you yeah. fire a patient, and all of a sudden they're blasting you online about yeah. not being able to see them and making up reasons why. So you know there is fear there, but I think you got to get over that. And there is a time and a place, especially in today's world, where you just got to break up with patients. Are are the um are the short call lists that you just don't call on? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I've thought of that one, but that's great. Uh, the last comment I have is just membership plans. You know, our, our membership patients, we've tracked them. The most compliant patients in our entire practice, they don't miss appointments. They're paying out of their pocket a membership to be there. And so it's only harming them to not be there. I mean, it's obviously harming you a bit, but it's really harming them to not be there. So having a good, strong membership uh, plan in place 
and getting as many of your patients on that plan as possible is going to reduce the risk of no shows just because those patients are showing up. I can tell you 99% of our members uh, are showing up to every one of their appointments. So, And Brad, um, it's so different because in a membership plan, they feel like they belong to the practice. Yeah. I have a saying, people don't no show on their friends. So to Bill's point about relationships, you know, I have a life philosophy that life is about relationships Life is important. Uh, life is about people and spending time with people you love. And there's no reason we can't love our patients. And when you give them a membership plan, they get a sense of belonging. And now since I'm a member and I belong to this practice, I'm much less likely to no-show. And that's what the data shows. Uh, you know, my our, our patients, our members love being part of our practice. They love the membership program. And uh, it's been a real um, honor of mine to help build that program and that that solution for other dentists. And, and I take stuff that I see in my practice and we put it in Dental HQ. We take feedback from other dentists and we're real proud of some of the solutions we put in there. And, and we've got a lot of cool stuff coming. So, um, you know, I think in the interest of time, it's going to be a little bit tight for us to get any questions in. But I think it's been a really powerful, powerful program we've had tonight with a lot of great takeaways for our listeners to, to think through and uh, take back to the practices. Again, this stuff doesn't happen on its own. You've got to go back to your practice. You've got to create a list and, and, and think about how to incorporate it into your business. But I think if you take these strategies and these kind of uh, thoughts to, to work from, you can really prepare yourself for whatever's coming. I mean, COVID was uh, a blind side that's hard to prepare for, but a recession, inflation, these kind of things, we can see the stuff coming. A recession is coming every five years on average for the, since the Great Depression, I guess they say. Uh, we know it's coming. So just have these uh, solutions and these ideas in place to protect yourself and lead through it, as Bill said. Uh, Roger, Bill, you guys have been fantastic tonight. I think the TDA uh, perks, uh, I, I want to thank the TDA perks for co-sponsoring this and helping us put this on. I hope the Texas dentists who are able to listen to this and hear the recording of this are able to glean a lot from it. Uh, I'm Brett Wells, Dental HQ, Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at DentalHQ.com if you have any questions. Um, and again, you're all going to get a takeaway of these 10 steps to, to help reduce cancellation. Sounds like Roger's got one too. So maybe you can call his, uh, the Levin group and get access to that. Uh, Bill's doing some great stuff with some um, uh, education for dentists in Texas. So if you're a Texas dentist looking for some help on how to build a phenomenal practice, he's done it twice, all fee for service, which is just amazing to me. Thank well, you. I love being with you guys. Thank you. I, I hope we were helpful and useful uh, and that we make a difference for our colleagues. That, that's, that would be a great evening if we've done that. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on what Roger said. I couldn't have said it better. It's been a pleasure being with you guys. Thank you so much.